download. We'll have all the links for it on EFF.RadioCon.org if you're interested. And uh, I'm going to let the panelists, I'm going to show up and let the panelists introduce themselves. And unlike Hacking 101, when we start at the far end of the table and work down, we'll start at the near end of the table. No, that makes me first again. <laughs> <laughs> no. You can pass on your turn. I'm not passing it. Okay, okay. 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 Um, and then I ran a, the number one pearl training company uh, during the late 90s while the dot-com boom was exploding. And some have argued that my books helped create the interactive web. Uh, and I would actually support that since I was there. Um, I then uh, went on to do uh, trainings on cruise ships. So I've been on 80 cruises in the last uh, 17 years. That's been really, really awesome. 640 sea days. Uh, I've been doing uh, uh, another little thing, maybe many of you might know me from this, Floss Weekly, my podcast, anybody here a Floss yeah. Weekly listener? Yeah, the number one open source podcast, check it out, we've been doing this for 10 years, and we've had some of the most amazing guests on, and what's great is that every week I get to talk to somebody cool, you know, that's, that's, that's great about a weekly podcast, is you get to talk to cool people, and like I said, we're getting about 50,000 downloads, so it's the number one open source podcast. So that's making me famous as well, which is nice. I don't mind fame because fame can sometimes be converted into cash. Uh, so that's kind of nice. I wasn't here last year. Uh, I, did I phone in on 101 or 201? 201. It's a blur. 201. Okay, so this, this panel last year. You know, make it louder. It's, I'm, I'm an inch away. All right. So, um, yeah, so I, I was uh, actually in the hospital last year. Uh, I had had a... Um, some sort of seizure uh, related to um, bad food. It's pretty simple way I said. I bought a, a sandwich at a Quickie Mart, and two days later, I was in the hospital. So, uh, yeah, sad. Uh, and I have a six-figure uh, medical bill now, which I'm slowly working off. You're going to need to write more books. I'm going to need to write more things, whatever it is. Yes, exactly. Um, but I'm very happy to be back here again. This is great. It's my 13th out of 15 years. Having me back. Just, to give, just to give you an example of how damn good his books are, um, you can tell how good or how successful someone or something is by how often it's pirated and people pirate the shit out of everything he likes. Exactly, exactly. But we're, we're going to pause for just a second because we've got a, a crypto challenge award winner. So yes, I'm just going to. Here, you can explain it better than me. So uh, if you may have heard uh, this. Uh, this year we did our third annual Crypto Challenge. We actually had 50 teams. We actually had 50 teams uh, competing this year. Uh, we actually uh, had a hard and or beginner and advanced level. We had, uh, let's see, um, we had first place in the beginner level. If you're here, Power of Friendship got all 10 right. Come up here, I got your prize. Is that pizza? It is. <laughs> um, Old pizza. So they got 95 points out of 100. They got basically 9 out of 10 without any clues, and they got the last one with a clue. Wow. Um, but there were there was close competition. There were six teams right there behind them getting nine, 8 out of 10. They just didn't get that last extra one. Um, in the hard level, this was a little more difficult. Um, the point scores there were in the winning team is Crypto Knights with 55 points. They actually received three out of the ten without any clues, um, and it was pretty hard. Um, so, if anybody here from Crypto Knights, oh, here you are. There you go. Um, and a close second was L LOL Electronics. Came close, but not quite there. If anybody has questions about some of the puzzles and wants to know how I came up with them and stuff like that, I'll be in back answering questions. Your name. Hi. Thank you very much. Woo! Congratulations to all the winners. Um, and uh, yeah, for everyone who entered, um, 
congratulations to you. Sorry you didn't get the big prize. Hopefully you learn the stuff and come back next year and keep playing. All right, let's uh, continue with the introductions, please. <coughs> I'm a software security <coughs> consultant uh, for a company called Synopsys, formerly Sigil. Um, I do a lot of pen testing, web app pen testing. Can't hear you. Testing, testing. Yeah, let's, let's just crank the room volume up. Check, 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 check. Swallow the mic. There we go. Right. Hi, I'm David. I, I'm a software security consultant at a company called Sigil, formerly. Okay, Sigil. Now Synopsys. We recently got acquired. Uh, I do a lot of pen testing from web apps, mobile apps, networks, red teaming, light reverse engineering, uh, a bunch of stuff. I started a lot more recently than all of these guys, so maybe I can give some context of starting in 2017. I probably have code older than you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, definitely. I wrote books before you were born. <laughs> so hello. Uh, that's Ooh. very loud now. All right. <laughs> yeah. That's perfect. Perfect. <laughs> My name is Jay Freeman, uh, but everyone online knows me as Sork. Uh, if you've heard of jailbreaking the iPhone, I run Cydia, the alternative to the App Store. Uh, so all jailbroken phones run my software, but I typically do not work on the actual exploit for iOS. I do everything that occurs after the hack. I was involved in a couple of them, but I did do some exploits for Android, where I, which I almost describe as the amateur bracket of hacking. Um, the um, uh, I have a background in uh, networking. I pioneered some features of the Nmap port scanner, such as its ability to determine what program and what version of the program is running on the remote side instead of that specific, uh, just, just what port. Um, I wrote the first decompiler for .NET, um, which ended up being used by Microsoft in order to do a test case with some of their compilers. Um, and I also, um, uh, what I'm currently most well known as far as like techniques is uh, runtime code modification. I developed Substrate, which is the uh, library and framework that's used on iOS in order to inject into and modify running programs and add functionality and, uh, and behaviors after the fact, as well as script, which is a hybrid of JavaScript, Objective-C, and now Java um, that allows you to inject a console into a running program and then replace out native parts of it with JavaScript. So I'm happy to answer any questions about reverse engineering or static analysis, uh, network uh, protocols, um, exploitation work, etc. And we're going to have a live demonstration of jailbreaking a phone, and I have graciously volunteered my phone to be jailbroken. So, uh, which, which is, it's like running Android 2.3.5 from like five years ago. <laughs> I think they can still break that. Yeah. I can't download the Dragon Con app, so since they didn't put the fucking PDF online before I throw down, I had no idea what the schedule was until I got on site. So. Uh, my name is Ray Kelly, and I work for HP Enterprise, or I did as of uh, Friday until they spun us all of our software off to a company called Microfocus, but I'll just say we're HP still. So uh, I work in a, we got acquired, I worked for a company called Spy Dynamics. We wrote an application called WebInspect, so it was an app that you know, I was the lead developer on it, and you would point it at a website, and it would go hack the website for you. So it could show you the vulnerabilities before the bad guys do. Uh, so that was kind of my main thing. Went on to some other startups. One was called PureWire, where we did cloud-based filtering. That got acquired by Barracuda. Went back to HP to run their uh, mobile pen testing team. So spent two years uh, doing mobile pen tests. Uh, so my thing is pretty much web application security. So uh, my name is Matt Blaze. Um, uh, my day job is as a professor in the computer science department at uh, University of Pennsylvania uh, in Philly. And I've been um, you know, active in the community as a hacker um, uh, probably you know, uh, since I was about 10 and a telephone enthusiast, as uh, they uh, um, uh, call them now. Um, but um, you know, really started doing this professionally um, and uh, working in computer security and cryptography uh, around uh, 1990 or so. Um, and I've uh, you know, done a number of things. I've done um, flaws in the uh, system called uh, the Clipper Chip uh, uh, that the U.S. government had, and uh, asked their parents about it, um, and uh, uh, found some flaws in wiretapping systems. And you know, although I'm you know, in sort of uh, normal life, I spend a lot of time on internet protocols and uh, internet uh, type software systems. I'm actually more interested in vulnerabilities and things other than stuff connected to the internet. And, uh, so I guess that's the perspective that I have here. 
All right, thank you. I'm Johnny X. I am your moderator. Um, at various points, I have been the space and science track director, the space track director, the science track director. I helped start the EFF track. I helped start the skeptics track. Um, I've started several hacker conventions or been a co-organizer. I've also disowned a couple. Um, <laughs> Uh, I've worked for Google, I'm currently looking, and I consider, and I do a lot of routing and switching stuff, and I consider myself more of a, a social engineering person than a hardcore tech person because I get into all sorts of crazy places and do all sorts of shit that I shouldn't be allowed to do. So, I trust. Thank you very much. I have no need for that, but I appreciate it. So, um, we should probably have a floor mic or something up here because I really don't want to run around the room uh, to people who raise their hands. So, do we bring the box? All right, we got a floor stand anywhere. We probably should have asked you about that. I am so sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, mic stand. Okay. If not, okay, I'll be human mic stand. He's, right. he's rolling his eyes. Uh, he's rolling his <laughs> eyes. I know. Sunday that. night. Yeah. We don't he was rolling his eyes. I'll be right back. All right, wait, yeah, I'll right stand back. here. Yeah, we'll wait here. So we'll just rip. Let's just keep ripping. That's all, I'll stand here. We'll buy a, a oh, shot or something. He's going in the secret stuff. equipment room back there. What else is back there? I don't know. As soon as we get the, the mic stand up here, I'm going to go back there and see. So first question, come on up. If you have questions, line up. That's how we do it. Anything goes, any questions, comments, criticisms, requests, death threats. Come on. That's my radio station days. We're not that entertaining until you ask us. I'm kind of tired. Can I be electrocuted? But of course. Oh. 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 Hey. Oh. We electrocuted him in 101. Yeah, what? he just he, he just doesn't react. He's, what? <laughs> I mean, he's I inhuman. He's inhuman. Replay, replay. I've got fresh batteries in the thing too, but I mean, <laughs> I heard you use Randall as a control. No, 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 did I say it all out? Okay. What? Yes, you did. Oh, Mike Burns. <laughs> so I'm kind of new to IT in that I'm, I'm studying for my APLS, I'm studying networking. I'm still on OSI, so you guys are like gods to me. Um, what, Everyone I, starts somewhere, so yeah. you're my learning. Quest, cool. My question is, how outside of tech did getting into this field affect you? Like, how did you, like you said, you are interested in vulnerabilities outside of technology. How did this, like, affect the way that you navigate through the world? I think you often look at where are the edges to things. Well, I do, so that's probably why it's more interesting for me. So I'm often looking at where are the edges. So here's the rule. Where are the edges to the rule? What's the thing I can hack about that? And that's not just in IT. It's not just in technology. It applies everywhere. Uh, in Hacking 101, I gave a story of hacking a menu you know, to be able to get exactly the drink I want instead of having to uh, pay for double price because it was half price for half the hourful thing. Go back and listen to the one one panel, you'll hear it. But I'm always trying to figure out, okay, what can I ask or do or say? My favorite example of this, again, not the, not the menu example this time, but uh, I took a class on, um, on, on finances. And the, uh, one of the things they said is, always ask for the discount. And I thought, I should try that. So I went into Kinko's the next day and I had a production run I had to do. And then I asked the barely college age guy behind the counter, I said, what about the discount? And he looks at me and he goes, what discount? And I go, the discount. <laughs> and he pulls the manager over. The manager pulls up his calculator and takes like 15% off. <laughs> ask, ask. That's the worst that'll happen is they'll say, no, you don't get a discount. Is this a property of your life that came from being in this field or from entering this field, or is this what brought you to this field? Uh, well, you know, I think it's because, well, but I've been in this field since I was like nine, so it's kind of, that's kind of hard to say before the field. But, you know, then being interested in computer security, I sort of kept exploring edges everywhere. So I think one, one thing, if I can just add to that, um, you know, one, there's one kind of generational gap up here. You know, uh, uh, 
uh, elderly folks, um, like at the two ends of uh, this uh, table, um, you know, we, we got into this field before um, it was a field, right? I mean, the, so we kind of <laughs> fell into it. And I think, you know, everybody kind of has their own origin story of what, the, what got them into it. For me, it was, you know, basically I didn't have a lot of resources. I didn't have, um, uh, you know, I wasn't going to a university that was studying this and studying this that had all sorts of computers and things. Um, at the time, I was getting interested in this. So I had to really fight my way for access to the technology that I wanted to play with. And that meant trying to figure out how to get things to do stuff that they weren't intended to do in order for me to be able to play with them. And, um, you, you know, along the way, I ended up discovering, oh, I'm doing computer security. That's kind of a thing. And, you know, now people kind of start, um, can start and say, oh, okay, there are role models, there's a career path, there's, there are things to do, I want to learn how to do those things. Um, so in some sense, um, you know, you can say that the current generation of people have it both easier and harder. Um, they have it easier because there are at least things to emulate, but they have it harder because, you know, uh, a, a lot of the low-hanging fruit and a lot of the, the paths to learn this where you can convert your passion um, into it have been kind of well, well tread. So I think there may be a generational um, uh, issue in answering that question. I think you'll have to be careful, though, when you say emulate. So in my particular history, of many of you new here know it because I've talked about it many years here, is uh, that uh, I pissed off Intel and I became a triple felon for it. And uh, so part of what you should do is read any of the chapters in 26 books now, I think is my last count, that talk about my case, <coughs> or go to my Wikipedia page and go, don't emulate that. <laughs> yeah. Unless you want to be a triple felon. You should also mention, like, well, this is being recorded, don't admit to any crimes. Yeah. Save that for when we're in the other room and we're no longer recording. Uh, real briefly to uh, um, add something to what you said about just you know, ask for the discount, that's kind of social engineering. Cops and lawyers are really good at it. Um, they ask for things which they are not entitled and which you are no, under no obligation to give them all the time. And if you just ask the right way, like the person you're talking to is supposed to give you whatever it is, it's amazing how many times they hand over things that they really shouldn't. This, uh, this young lady has been waiting quite patiently, so thank you very much. No, I completely understand. Um, one, it's that, that asking, just, just making sure that you actually get every discount that, you know, could be there. That's a lifestyle. That's not something that's taught. I think that's just kind of, okay, you know, let, let, let's see what I can do because, you know, I, I I may or may not have gotten into tomorrow world. Like, like behind the just oh, um, weren't you with the uh, weren't you with the the press? Yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, two, as far as getting into hacking, getting into just just computer security, IT security, anything like that. Now, I think I, I get kind of jealous, you know, um, in the '90s and in 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 um, that time computers were horribly insecure. And in my in my head I'm like, wow, I was doing, you know, I was on video pads at the time, but you know, I could I could kind of see some of the stuff that you guys were exploiting. Um, and I'm jealous because it was so much easier back then. However, the time when I look at it, it's like, huh, it can still be done. You just have to work a little bit harder. And it's it's the challenge that kind of gets me I work. think though that the, in the nineties there weren't as many computers and the attack right. vector wasn't the service vector was not as right. big. Now, I mean, once we put Windows desktops on every person's machine, mm -hmm. now we have a huge attack vector. Exactly. Don't run Windows. <laughs> Just don't. There's the Internet of, of Things is making uh, it very easy yeah. to get into stuff. So. I can do a refrigerator. My question was, um, you know, I've, I've studied a lot of the, you know, security and, and networking. I do a lot of vulnerability scanning in my job and um, a lot of uh, setting baselines and stuff like that. However, I desperately, I've been doing this kind of for my entire life under the radar, but how can you get into social engineering? That's like, uh, how do you do something like that for a lifestyle professionally? Yeah. 
Um, that would be, I guess, and I, I wish she was here, a panelist we had last year, she just couldn't make it for financial reasons. Um, uh, Scott will have her information, but listen to the Hacking 101 and 201 talks last year, and she talks about red team physical penetration, and a lot of that involves social engineering. Red teams or the offensive teams, physical penetration is getting into buildings and places, right. and that involves a lot of social engineering. I was there last year. I, oh, think, okay. I think I know you. I think okay, that. yeah, yeah. Listen, listen to those talks, and if you're, are you local? Are yes. you with? Um, if you're not already on the DEF CON 404 <laughs> mailing list, Get on the mailing list. The Atlanta 2600 mailing list is good too. Start going to the meetings and start talking to people. Network with other people who are similar. Uh, if you have a comment, come up and say it into the microphone so we can get it recorded. Um, they're hosting uh, the hackers, uh, I can't remember the name of the exact convention, but their convention in Atlanta in October. And since you're a woman, you can go free. They've given <laughs> IBM scholarships to all women to go. Um, Hacker Paul. I can. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is what we do: is we get people talking to each other here. I, but they're having, they're having, uh, they're having red blue uh, marathons. I'll get it and I'll, I'll announce it so all the women can sign up for it. Yeah, and get the information. Get the information also to Scott. Uh, he's the EFF track director, EFF at DragonCon.org, and he can put it as an update on the EFF.DragonCon.org website. So I assume they're, they're going to check your ID if that you're a woman, but you could try it as a man too. Social engineering. I would also, I, I would follow that up with, uh, uh, back, back about 20 years ago, 15 years ago, I started studying this thing called Neuro Linguistic Programming, NLP, Grinder and Bandler's books. There's such an amazing wealth of things, particularly in the book Transformations, where they talk about how if you reach out to make a handshake with somebody, and then you pull it away before they finish the handshake, they're actually stunned for two to three seconds. And at that point, you can say almost anything, and it goes straight past the filters. It's pretty amazing what they figured out with their work in neuro linguistic programming. NLP, check it out. We should practice that also. Um, I don't know if this is an inappropriate question to ask at 201. I mean, I missed the newbie stuff. But what. What skills, uh, right now I'm trying to move from the department I'm in into systems. I'm trying to stack my skills and also get certification as well. What primary skills, like top three skills you think I should have in order to make it? My ideal uh, job description would be security analyst, I'm trying to go for. So what top three skills do you think I should have? Well, really, what would you be happy doing all day? <laughs> That's the real question. Never pick a job that's not about you being happy all day. I've reinvented my career six times already because I've kept saying, no, I don't want to do this anymore, I want to do this. Pick the things that will make you happy. Yeah, I, I'd like to add to that too, absolutely. So pick an area you like. I, I like developing, I like coding. So I get in that area, like I said, web application security. You know, there's networking security, there's social engineering, there's, there's many aspects Find what you enjoy and try a little bit of all of it. You know, I hate networking. It's, it's stupid. <laughs> but, uh, but, 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 after, <laughs> but I love coding and I love breaking code, uh, other people's code, and that is just enjoyable to me. So find what you like first and then dive in into that area. Yeah, along with that, uh, for us, when we hire people, generally the key thing we look for is uh, something called being creatively malicious. Uh, you want to be able to have, have a mindset going into something where it's like uh, you want to go into something and, and you want to say like if someone asks you how would you break this, you should be able to come up with an idea that's that, that's pretty realistic but also creative in, in how you approach something like that. Are you training and or hiring? Uh, talk to you afterwards. Mentorship <laughs> programs. <laughs> so. Something, something that I would say, um, uh, you asked for some skills, and I would mention that uh, generally having understanding of how compilers work would be really helpful to get an understanding of how to, of how to um, attack native code and getting an understanding of some common web frameworks. Um, but the kind of the, the question that you're kind of driving at that a lot of us up here answering of, of how do you get into this sort of thing if you, if you see it and you're kind of excited about it, but you're not certain how to make it a, your skill or your life. Um, the recommendation that I would give is some, possibly the same way that you might get into being a magician. So there's, there's like this skill of trying to 
um, of, of trying to uh, trick somebody into, into, into thinking that you're doing one thing, you're actually doing something else. Or that you're, in this case, you're trying to get a computer program to, to do something, and you're trying to hide information from it at various points. A lot of these things I'm coming down to, like little tricks of the trade, that people, once they're real magicians, are coming up with. Like when you, when you hear about a great magician, they're not doing the same trick you've heard of hundreds of thousands of times before. But you, you don't seem to start getting magic by doing that. You get to start getting the magic because when you were a kid, you, you were told how to do a little trick, and you do it for your parents, and you do it for your friends, and you kind of trick them with that thing, and then you start getting an understanding of those, those processes. I didn't get into doing computer program like um, the really complicated parts of it of doing um, you know uh, um, uh, return oriented programming or trying to uh, do buffer overflow attacks or anything just de novo from nowhere. I started by seeing existing attacks, learning what the vulnerability was, and then reading the code for it, and then learning about existing attacks and trying to write my own implementation of that attack, and then hearing about um, uh, different classes of attack, and kind of stretching my skill to the point where I had this build up in my mind of all of these different techniques that people generally can utilize. And then when I see something new, I'm able to look at it and go, oh, what kinds of, what kinds of mistakes are here that I'm often seeing before? And sometimes I find a new kind of mistake. But I don't think it just comes out of like, Sorry. just you know all the skills. It kind of becomes like a practice of seeing the kind, the, the, the thought process. And the, the practice of the thought process isn't you learn how to do low-level software development and you learn about web frameworks and you do this. It's, it's, it's like getting into the culture of hacking and seeing it. Yeah, yeah. I, just to add to that, programming is both a science and an art. The science in the sense of, you know, red plus yellow equals orange. But there's the art of having seen so many solutions and then being able to twist it a little, move it forward, standing on the shoulders of giants ahead of you. And that's where the skill comes. So I, you know, I teach in a university for a living and I get that very question from like our undergrads and grad students, how do I get into this? And you know, there are two parts to this. But one is the sort of artistry part, and you know, how do you get the attitude? And you get the attitude by studying how things have happened and trying to emulate them and by, you know, maybe ideally, you know, get under the wing of somebody who knows this. But you also kind of want the foundations. And the foundations are particularly the computing systems foundations. Like if you're in college, you really want to be taking the operating systems class. You really want to be taking the compilers class. If you're not, you want to be um, a computer architecture as well. If not, you know, you want to get the equivalent knowledge and experience and have those, those things at your fingertips. Really understanding how the program runs on a computer from the hardware and the instructions all the way up to the actual interaction that it's doing, that's probably the central kind of foundational skill that we all share. Um, and um, you know, then on top of that, it's, it's you know, developing the attitude, the, I love the term creative malice um, that, 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 that you've come up with, but you also kind of need, you know, you need both that and the foundational stuff. Thank you. And I really want to back up Matt on that because I know sometimes people hear like, oh, we need to learn these foundations. They're like, no, no, no I dropped out of college. I didn't pay much attention to that thing. And still, <laughs> I think you top out in your ability to, to get some things done. When you start doing super advanced reverse engineering, there is a lot of math in that. Uh, and, I, and I really love having had the math background of going through as, uh, and, and taking advanced math courses when I was in college and in some of the grad school work that I did. Um, if you have it, it's okay if you didn't do that in college, you can still do that now. Uh, but don't just think, oh, well, you know, the, all of this like academia parts are not interesting. They really are foundations, as he has the turn of, of, of the work that we do. Right. So. Last quick comment: find friendly communities, online communities. If it's mailing list, websites, meetups, and if you can find physical meetings, go to them and network with people and just ask questions, experiment, play. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. You learn more from your mistakes than your successes. If you try out a community and the people there are assholes, hey, it's 2015. There are a zillion online communities now. It's not like that. It's, it's 2017. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll play two. I'll play two. Yeah, whatever. What, what year is it? Yeah, it, yeah, okay. We're in the 21st century. It's not like the 1980s or 90s That's where there right. were a That's few true. limited no. communities. You've got a zillion places to go. If you run into assholes, go somewhere else. There's friendly people who want to teach and uh, share knowledge everywhere. Next question. Thank you, sir. Thank you all of you for your patience. Let's try to keep the answers a little bit briefer. Uh, forgive me if this is a little rambling, but uh, during the last year I've had uh, 
experiences or at least exposure to the uh, Internet of Things when I got to update my kitchen and was offered smart refrigerators, smart oven, <laughs> smart uh, microwaves, uh, smart thermostat, which I didn't get any of. But um, I would like to get your opinion on the vulnerability and why they even think it needs to have uh, internet connectivity on any of these appliances and why it would possibly outweigh the benefits of you know the not having it. Uh, the other question I have for you is I'm actually a mechanic by trade and uh, I've been updating software on the many, many, many computers in the 15 and 16s and with the new Bluetooth that they have built into the calls with the automatic service reminders and stuff like that, doesn't that open up a new port of attack for uh, getting into them without having to gain physical access? Yeah, I mean the short answer is yeah and we're all going to die. <laughs> Going to be connected while we die. <laughs> People weirdly like that um, the, uh, the, the the convenience or argument of having network connected devices. I mean, if you have the people seem to like having an Alexa listening to them constantly and then trying to figure out what they're saying and asking questions. Whereas I walk through a room, I see an Alexa, and I just get terrified. Um, hey, Wiretap, what's the lyrics to my favorite song? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, um, uh, there, a, an example of one where uh, a concrete one that people seem to really think is, is a great idea is uh, network attached door locks, um, so that uh, you can temporarily hand access to somebody by, um, and then revoke it easily. Like you're only able to get into my house for the next two hours because I really need you to get in there, and then I can revoke that. But of course, once you have a network attached door lock and they're all the same door lock, and there's a vulnerability in it, now you can just unlock every door at once. Whereas at least there was there was some time you had to spend in order to pick each individual lock that you would with the lock pick, right? Um, the, uh, so I'm a, then I'm, I'm a member of a group called uh, Exploiteers, somewhat adjunct, um, but they, uh, they always put my name on their slides, which is something that's awkward, uh, which at, at, at DEF CON every year does a talk on hacking large numbers of Internet of Things devices, and they're ludicrously insecure. Um, and they are actually kind of a, a fun way to get into some of this stuff because they typically are like a one-off stupid device built by somebody who has no idea about security. They, a lot of these things, the firmware never gets upgraded because they figure they're going to sell you the next physical update, so why bother to update the firmware? And then you have shit sitting out there for years that's, yeah, I hate the Internet of Things. Yeah, the, this is, and the other problem with that is, uh, what, is it, the, what, what application was it that recently they did an update and the, and locked everybody out. <laughs> Which so, one? It was one, you know, it was one that just like smart three or four weeks ago. Smart, smart lock, yes, yeah, so smart lock somewhere got updated and it locked everybody out. I kind of like the Samsung smart TVs where they forced a firmware update and it ripped these two thousand dollar TVs. That and the interesting thing I found out um, a lot of these items now the physical items are shipping before the firmware has even been written or figured out and they just stick a bootloader in there. So when you start it up, it immediately demands an internet connection to actually download the firmware to make it work because they're on such a tight schedule to get it out to market. They don't bother to write the code first. They just ship you the shit and think, Pick it up the internet. We'll send you the software when it's ready, maybe. And I, I'll, I'll add to like a, a, about a year ago, I was fooling around like, I want to write my own uh, IoT scanner. I want to look for IoT devices on networks. And like everyone's doing that now. But I was fooling with it a couple years ago. And just testing out in my house, I ran it, so I scanned my, my whole IP range in my house, and the server shows up, and I said, there's no server there. I know what's on my network, there is nothing there. And I could not figure out what the hell was responding. And so I took the IP address, and I dropped it in a browser, who knows, maybe it's a web interface, and sure enough it was. A, a page came up that had like Pandora settings and Spotify settings. I'm still thinking, what the hell is this thing? I don't have anything. What it ended up being was my Onkyo receiver. I had to plug it into the network for uh, firmware updates. Well, it was also hosting its own web server embedded inside of it, and I had no clue it has been plugged in for a year. Who knows the last time that thing got updated? So things that you don't even know that are IoT is kind of shocking, too. And then a lot of these devices have ludicrously insecure firmware update mechanisms. And, yep. and it, but in addition to having a bunch of sensors attached to your network, and so now maybe you can even remotely update the firmware, or even if you use like local access for a couple seconds, you can change all the software running on it, and who will ever figure out or notice the fact that you're now listening to them? This is not what we had in mind as the internet back in the 80s and 90s when we were creating this shit. I don't know when we lost control, but this was not what we had in mind. We, hey, mate. we have achieved hey, mate. peak internet. It was like three years ago. Three years ago. Sorry about the rant. Go. No, by all means. 
uh, Matt, I just want to make sure, is, is this the same Matt Blaze that has written the extraordinarily nice books about how radios of all types, including ham radios, can be used in all types of emergencies? No. I, I mean, I... <laughs> Same collision. Why did you not say yes? You could have spewed out yeah, all sorts I, of crazy <laughs> bullshit. Yeah, I mean, I, I do radio stuff, but I, I, I never, I never wrote that book. Okay, <laughs> must be that for my plays. Yeah. My apologies. Uh, second, just a quick question: Do I have any of your objections to tapping into the power outlets over here? Not my hotel. I don't give a shit. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Not my circus, not my monkey. <laughs> if you electrocute yourself, um... Well, at least they did. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, uh, I recently left uh, Apple Corporate. I was a regional trainer for five years. Uh, the thing here is that I never actually learned anything about code. I have a liberal arts degree. So I have no real formal education in terms of that. And so it's really been this thing of self-taught study. And I recently had a job interview, and it was just two hours of straight logic games. I have never been under anything like that in my life. And I was wondering if just being that y'all are kind of the leaders in the tech industry, what are you assessing for exactly? How do you feel about that? Like, like, like my response, it was a man in the middle attack. They're like, oh, it is a uh, lock. You send it to him. Uh, and then you have to send, I was like, oh, there's an app for that. You can just scan the key and then have a locksmith uh, make the key in the other country. There is actually an app for that. And they were like, what? Um, so I, I was just wondering like, how y'all feel about that. Any advice on tech interviews, like, especially since I'm branching out uh, just from strictly Apple to try and embrace everything? Yeah, so, I mean, I will say... I'm not a tech leader or a coder, so... So, I mean, I'll speak, I'll speak to that a little bit. Um, so, because I, I send my students off to these companies where they do these awful tech interviews, and, and you know, I, I think kind of one thing everyone seems to agree on is the Silicon Valley-style tech interview is like this incredibly broken process that, um, you know, tests for skills that are only tangentially relevant. Um, and you know, one of the problems is that uh, you know that's excluding people who are you know can really will really do badly on that interview process, but um, you know have very promising careers ahead of them. And so you know, it's very. I, I share your opinion about how um, uh, how awful uh, some of this is. That said, that's starting to change. Um, you know, uh, the Google interview of you know, five years ago was very different from the Google interview um, today. Um, I think that's also, you know, becoming true at big companies like Apple and Amazon and so on. But, um, you know, I, I think that, that cracking that interview process is, uh, you know, a, that, that's a real problem on both the interviewee side and the interviewer side. Yeah. I think the most important thing to do is, how many people here are familiar with the dailywtf.com? Got a few. Go check it out. TheDailyWTF.com. This is tales of tech horror every day, yeah. and about at least once a week they talk about a terrible tech interview. And the reason I'm going to point you at that site is for you to recognize when you're being led down a path that's not going to be useful in the tech interview. Uh, but again, back to the person's question. Did you go away? He, he went back. Oh, I went back. Okay, okay. So, okay. So, so the, the the point is, why are you moving from liberal arts to tech? What what do you like about tech? And if you're not like studying that in your entire alpha hours, you're not going to ace a tech interview. That's just how simple it is. So please, you know, spend every off hour you have learning the thing you want to get to. And if you don't find that that is fun, stop doing it, please. We have way too many programmers that don't belong as programmers. Thank you. I'll give you my two cents real quick on how I aced my Google interview, which is nothing like, was nothing like the horror stories I heard about. And this was in 2004 when they were still um, uh, privately held before they went public and I apparently beat out 3,000 other people for this job and um, I 
I'm sure I was not the most qualified person for the job, but I made sure my resume had no spelling mistakes in it, and it was very neat. I showed up for the interview in a suit, and I was wearing one of the geekiest ties you can imagine. It had computers all over it and Tabasco sauce bottles. I was sitting reading the uh, latest issue of Linux Journal in the interview room where all the other people were waiting, and when they called me to interview and I flip my bag open and put my bag in, I accidentally dropped the motherboard tester and power supply tester out of my bag. It was, oh, excuse me, let me put those back in. And the interviewer, um, I, there were three people for the interview. The interviewer asked me like three bozo questions based on my last job, like what's an HTTPD conf file, um, something about hard drives and something about RAM. And that was it. That was my interview. I got the call the next day and was like, got the offer. And I just went in as Mr. Uber Geek and this is what I like doing and I've got all the toys here in the bag and I love technology. <laughs> it clearly matters a lot what company you interview for. Um, I, I had an interview with a company um, where by the end of it, um, I, I spent most of the interview questioning the entire business model of the company, and by the end of it, we were screaming at each other over the, fat, over the whole thing. And then the person said, okay, so do you want the job? Because this was awesome. And I was like, seriously? <laughs> by the way, that's social engineering right there. <laughs> what he did. Yeah. That's all that it is. Yep. All you have to do is go to LinkedIn nowadays, read what their stupid stuff says. Oh, this is what I'll say to you. For the most part. Yeah, I'll tell you about the radio station story when we're done. You know, we've got a lot of questions here. <laughs> all right, so as you've all been in the industry for so long, X amount of years, what happens when you find a vulnerability inside of the company you work for and you tell them and they don't believe you? <laughs> and they don't believe you? Yeah, you get a fellow. And they don't care. Well, Short I stock. <laughs> <laughs> It is a personal time. No. Uh, <laughs> quick little part of it is I asked, so we're a security team, a small company that I was working for at the time. We don't have anything facing out. We don't have to worry about being hacked. <laughs> I said, okay, and walked away from the CTO. Document it to cover your ass. Keep copies of your documentation. Make sure it's signed off on. Have your resume ready to go just in case. <laughs> Already done. Thanks. All right. Next All right, um, we got on the subject of Internet of Things and it sounded like there's a lot we can talk about there. <laughs> um, so my wife and I were remodeling our kitchen and uh, yes, we saw the fancy tacky refrigerators and I had just started a job working in application security and talked to my friends about this. I, I thought it was kind of odd that my fridge could now be connected to the Internet and they explained why this was a bad idea, and I kind of understood it already, but it was just confirmation. I'm sorry, Dave. I can't open the refrigerator door. Here. <laughs> you exceeded your calorie intake for the day. <laughs> we do not um, recognize you. But uh, having a conversation with one of the salespeople was quite entertaining. Um, the new fridges, um, the cooling mechanisms in the back, the piping and all that, the tubing, um, it is now enclosed. Uh, the reason why it's enclosed is um, basically this shortens the functional life of the refrigerator. This is a business model. Um, you can pay someone every year to come out and remove this backing and clean off the elements because dust builds up on them and them being open was actually allowing your system to continue to run. But now that it's enclosed, now that it's sealed, uh, the airflow is restricted. And I said, well, you know, um, if, if this thing's connected to the internet and how long is that software going to be supported by the company, you know, because eventually they're going to stop supporting it and then what? And they said, well, that's part of the reason why we now have this backing on the refrigerators. Uh, we're expecting the serviceable life of a refrigerator, which used to be about 20 years, to now be about four or five. Oh, so you're buying a new $2,000 fridge every four or five years. That's the business model, disposable society. Um, so the question, 
Uh, what is your most ridiculous Internet of Things appliance that you've come across? <laughs> There's a, uh, there's an IoT dildo, actually. He wins. It has a, uh, it has a camera attached to it as well. It, where, where is the camera attached? In the front of it, I Apparently it's a fetish or something. And this goes under the right now over privacy data. Yeah. So it's network attached. It's network attached. Okay. That's it has, it, has, it has a web server attached to it. And you can live yeah. stream from it. Except it turns out to credentials or something, and they were able to hack into it. Like they found, you know, like 10 to 15 people who are live. But would, without oh, knowledge. Would DDoS there be yeah. the digital dildo <laughs> attack? <laughs> These things also grab your orgasms. No. It's crazy. Oh, oh, metrics. <laughs> yeah. Wow, honey, you killed it tonight. <laughs> we can't follow up. We're quitting tonight. <laughs> that one went to 11. <laughs> <laughs> or 12. <laughs> oh, oh, I, 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 I just had a comment on the refrigerator thing. Yeah. I think that this is the point now where we, let's see, $2,000 for a new refrigerator that's only going to last four years. Getting a monthly membership at your local maker space and just building your own fucking refrigerator that will last the rest of your life. What I'm thinking. Okay. Has anyone heard of a network attached refrigerator that gives you remote control over the like like of, of the the little temperature thing inside the refrigerator? Yeah. I'm, like, I'm highly yeah. concerned about attacks that people can have of like turning your refrigerator a temperature up at night and then like slow like making your food spoil three yeah. times faster yeah. than it's supposed to. Yeah. 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 We're losing control. Just jump in. Yes. All right. I don't have a question. I did find out the convention. It's called Hackers Halted. I have the code right here for any women who want to attend for free. And it is zombie oriented, right? That's uh, that's the zombie. I think it's dragon. I thought. Oh, uh, maybe they change every year. The year I went, it was all zombies. I just heard about it this year, so awesome. I'm going. So it'll be fun. Then we can put it on the website. Or and you're going to give us a report next year, right? Sure. So fantastic. Um, I want to really to question more comments on uh, what we said earlier about the plan obsolescence where they're specifically <laughs> designing things to break so you have to either get a new one, ostensibly the best option for a business model, or get a repair, subscription fees. Um, I think the broader scope of hacking has really encouraged a lot of people to say, yeah, fuck that, and uh, go fix it yourself. Case in point, for the refrigerator, just take the back off. You want to open air, just take it off. Uh, Another case point, I can't tell you how many jacuzzis I've tried repairing where there's actually no seal to keep the water out from the actual control of the components controlling the heat. Just a little bit of hot glue and like some plastic, you're great. Um, and to take it a step further, if anyone would like to experiment with this, uh, so I recently found out that you can, uh, if you have a card writer, you can actually change the string of numbers at the very beginning to make your chip card swipe normally. Oh. Ooh. So, uh, Ooh. yeah. <laughs> 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 You just became the most popular person yeah. in the world. Yeah. 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 Remember, you can't yeah. change it. We have a question for you. Just change it to one, two, three, four, is that what? Uh, yeah, there's, it's like a, it's like a, it's, I figured it's like the third or fourth digit. It's a three, you change it to a one or a two, it wow. swipes normally. Wow. It's my luggage combo. Okay. Yeah, so just play with that. Okay. No more steps. You're, you're stressing me out. Alright. Alright. Thanks for your comments. Uh, just to follow up on the Internet of Things. Um, <laughs> when I was looking at the refrigerators, you could remotely change the temperature in the refrigerator for CRISPR, monitor the temperatures and change them. And my biggest fear was actually of the oven because you could actually remotely turn on the burners and oven. That's burn. like a big trouble waiting to happen. Yeah. Do you remember the name of this product? Uh, Samsung. It's from Samsung. That's <laughs> natural. It seemed to be catching a lot of things on fire. <laughs> Good at burn, baby, burn. <laughs> All right. Oh, uh, Mr. Audio Guy in the back, I fixed your broken microphone stand. 
<laughs> so okay, I just wanted to let you know. <laughs> so for the cryptographers right, on the panel, uh, like to or Kachek? Huh? Say the question I again. I the question. I don't have any <laughs> so, you know, yeah. answer. Like, which one is preferred for applications or... I'm trying to get, like, a fight going, but it's not working. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it's too specific a question. Ah, uh, oh well. I'm sorry, we There's don't have the 40 questions. ounce of really cheap shit we can shake up and throw to you overhand, but feel free to try again. I mean, it's, it's Bring it's up okay. which wine your pizza, we'll get a fight going. Security <laughs> is uh, being whack-a-mole. You know, you, and the uh, moles are winning, I think, not the whackers. How do you reverse that? My personal feel is putting a lot of stuff in hardware not that you can't screw up hardware, but it, it's usually more correct than a lot of software. Not always. Um, I play, I've seen that uh, Intel's probably caught up with Multics uh, from the 60s about five years ago. I used to be a systems administrator on the Multics system. So, so one, one thing that you run into is that people really like being able to plug their devices into a USB port in order to be able to fix them. Um, and that was actually, I, I was talking to somebody at Apple about this, um, because, so, a lot of Android devices, you could plug them in um, to, a, to a serial port if you had a special cable adapter, but you couldn't necessarily be guaranteed of reflashing them over USB. Um, and and when, they, when you could, you were actually, it wasn't like a low-level bootloader, you, were, you, was, you actually could like, ruin its ability to be flashed over USB because you could, you could destroy both the primary bootloader that you could just reflash and destroy the actual normal boot, the normal boot process. On iOS, there was a firmware like USB level and you could drop all the way down that you cannot, up, you cannot upgrade. And the reason why is that they could plug into a USB port. You aren't going to implement the USB protocol fully in like a state machine in hardware, you're going to implement that in software. Um, but as soon as they provided that ability to just guarantee you can always plug into a USB port and fix it no matter how horribly broken the, the processes get, that means there is essentially a pretty hard-coded USB bootloader in there that we found a bug in, uh, that then that device is just permanently owned. And so um, it, it, it's this weird trade-off of you can, the more stuff you just demand is in like only accessible and like trivial hardware, the, the less functionality it gets to the point where somebody might not want it anymore. Yeah, and it's also just worth pointing out the distinction between hardware and software. I no longer have any idea where to draw that line. Um, you know, soft hardware is basically designed. You know, the days that people laid out chips and figured out that this transistor goes here, you know, that those are long gone, right? You know, chips are designed by writing software um, that uh, that lays them out and figures out what uh, what goes there. You know, FPGAs blur that distinction between hardware and software. And device controllers, you know, the, are basically com fully function general purpose computers with a lot of unused capacity. So, um, you know, the distinction between, you know, telling yourself, oh, don't worry, the hardware handles that, that can't be hacked, um, is, uh, you know, no, we no longer have any, any of the assurances we used to have. The moment hardware has a program counter, it's vulnerable. <laughs> Uh, I currently do blue team incident response, and of course, as part of that, we have a red team at work as well that we have to deal with. Um, just kind of a, a funny note, like for example, we had one incident where our red team actually registered a domain in our department director's name, <laughs> and then proceeded to send us an email with a malicious macro-enabled document. We, nice. you know, we, we ended up having to deal with that and figure out what was coming from our department director dot com. <laughs> but uh, my question is, uh, do you guys have red teams at your jobs? And what are some just in interesting incidents you've had to deal with from them, if you do? Uh, I've been on red team engagements before for clients. Uh, I've never been on the blue team side, though. Uh, our most recent run-in, though, when we plug in the USB drive into some dude's computer, it pulled down, executed some code. Uh, to get us some stuff on his computer. They actually caught it instantly, which surprised us. Um, and they confiscated his laptop, and he didn't have it for the entire day. And they are running around searching for this mysterious process that appeared on his computer and the code that it executed and what it did to his computer. Uh, because apparently, the guy who's in charge of testing didn't necessarily tell the blue team and the security operations center that 
there was a pen test going on. Oh, oh shit! Oh. So, so the poor guy was uh, was without a laptop for an entire day and a half until they came back and said, oh, whoops. <laughs> All right, so this is kind of an well, this is short. Uh, this is kind of an open-ended thing. Uh, Just pick it up. What are your guys' thoughts on the Intel? <laughs> you won't be able to see that on the audio recording. Um, <laughs> what are the What are your guys' thoughts on the Intel uh, management engine uh, that's built on the chips? Do you guys think that's like a conspiracy, or do you think that they're really a pain to have on there, especially since there's a disable bit that's recently? I'm not saying it's aliens, but it's aliens. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, I don't like it. I don't like what I've read. Yeah, it's, it's difficult always to assign intent. Um, I, there, there's some things that on uh, Motorola devices, um, uh, just in case, um, one of the uh, J case, one of the people who does a lot of uh, Android hacking, which is swears it's a backdoor, but it's really difficult to tell if it's a backdoor or if it was a really lazy engineer. Yeah. Um, yeah. It could be both. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, so, you know, I have done reviews of voting systems technology, you know, the uh, voting machines, and, you know, the first question is, is there a backdoor in these systems? And the answer is always, you know, if they spent money in inserting a backdoor into these systems, that was a complete waste of money because there's so many security vulnerabilities in them. Backdoor would be uh, completely redundant. And that's, that's pretty much true of any complex large-scale system. So, yeah, I, I'm skeptical of the conspiratorial theories. Here. They retribute the balance of stupidity, what, what can be adequately explained by stupidity. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yes. Cool. Thanks. Got any other questions at the moment? Um, we could, if y'all want, since it's uh, 11 o'clock, we could take like a 10 minute break if people want to hit the bathroom or refresh drinks or something like that. I would re ask my question how do we get out of the whack a mole mode? Um, cut all the internet backbone links to Russia and then send the nukes. <laughs> 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 yeah, I think China's going to have to be dealt with too. That's our warning to China. <laughs> As an industry, we don't learn. Like there are, there are a lot of things that we've kind of got, gotten to the point of just understanding you never do this, but it takes a decade before we get to the point where we're really teaching people to not do it. I mean, an example is, is, is the decade of people doing PHP applications and not using, um, and, do, and having SQL injection attacks. Um, oh. We have, like, like that, that, that should have been fixed immediately, and essentially it's used to immediately remove all the APIs that allow you to do the, like the raw string API, and then actually have the, like the, the, the ones with little question marks. It's just, there's so many ways that can be addressed. Um, we, we, have, we continue to write programs um, in, uh, in programming languages that were really not the right level of, of scale for that thing. We end up with um, buffer overflow attacks, and we end up uh, introducing um, just way too many vulnerabilities. It's also like every person you hire at your company is technically a mole because every one of those is a valid attack vector from someone trying to get into your company. Like if one person clicks a phishing link and types in your credentials, it's it's done. Closer to mic, please. Quick, quick clarification: I wasn't really serious about nuking Russia just because you know I don't want that kind of death and mayhem on my conscience, and I really, really admire the Russian uh, and Soviet space program. I hate Putin and his government, but their space program, mm -hmm. space program, considering how little money they have to work with and how much bullshit they have to put up with, is it's amazing what they've been able to accomplish with it. So, no news for Russia. Sorry about that if I upset anyone. <laughs> Just Moscow. I don't give a shit about that. <laughs> so. Learning to use Metasploit, I came to find there's just all sorts of vulnerabilities in all sorts of programs, uh, you know, some going back, you know, 10, 20 years. Um, over the years, though, like, have you run into, like, just any favorite vulnerabilities that are just so ridiculous that, you know, it's just, like, how could this even be a thing? <laughs> uh, I think it was brought up earlier. SQL uh, injection attacks were so prevalent, and they didn't need to be. And it's still going on. You know, it's like the, the Bobby Tables thing from XKCD, you know, it's like, it's so crazy out there that you would ever inject a string into another string and then call SQL on it. That doesn't make any sense to me. We've all had in all languages a way to avoid that. And why is that ever a thing? But the funny thing is, it means sometimes when I go in and say, here's my password, they go, oh, it can't contain a single quote. What the hell? Why can't it contain a single quote? Because they're scared of it being some part, somewhere in the data chain of an SQL attack. 
The, um, uh, so I mentioned earlier the group exploiteers that does a lot of Internet of Things hacking. They kind of have a shtick, which is like the first thing they do is they will, they will take the device which attaches to some Wi-Fi network and they will attach it to a Wi-Fi network with an SSID that tries to do a shell injection attack. Because virtually all of these devices are running on Linux and they will use the Wi-Fi configurations uh, program, that's like the default one, and they will just pass the SSID as an argument that they just paste in there. And not that many people have SSIDs that contain like shell, shell quoting and anything like that, and so that usually succeeds. Nice. Wow. Uh, th this one kind of blew me away. Uh, we were on an engagement with a very large government organization. And uh, so they already had an IDS set up, or they were doing NetFlow, so analyzing shady activity on the network. And they said, no, we already got a product for that. We, you know, Don't worry about it. And they're like, come on, guys, we had an agreement. Let's just hook in our appliance and just monitor the, the traffic going on. And so I said, sure, go ahead. So we plug it in, and sure, the thing lights up. <laughs> Alarms are going off. Oh, my God, horrible things. Requests are going to China, going to Russia, <laughs> everywhere on this network. And uh, we were trying to figure it out, and they tracked down the IP address where it was coming from. And when we got to, when we figured out to the specific laptop where it was coming from, it was a general. And he's like, I don't even use this laptop. Generals don't use laptops, right? So they're like, I don't even use it. <laughs> And well, what do you, I mean, what do you do with it? Well, the only thing I do with it is charge my e-cigarette on it with the USB cable. Oh, oh, and so, sure enough, we take the e-cigarette and on the back, made in China, <laughs> and we analyze that. Sure enough, there was malware inside the e-cigarette. And so those are being distributed in the United States. Uh, so anyways, I was like, that is awesome. <laughs> and that's an IoT. <laughs> Another incredibly, <laughs> incredibly common thing that is just uh, is how how many people not learned yet is is J Case's shtick. So it, what he he will get by the random Chinese Android device, and typically what will happen is is that the developers who are working on it at some point the device stopped booting because the permissions on some folder or some file became wrong, and the developer just cannot figure out where in the system that's happening because there's over the course it only only affects the device during boot up or during startup of some process, and you know it was only when it runs for a few days and they reboot it, it has this issue, so they finally they just they just freak out and they add to the init scripts chmod seven 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 that file, and as soon as as soon as you have that line in there you can just replace that file with a sim link to anything you want on the system and then. Because uh, oftentimes, it, because the only reason that file permissions would change is because it's in a folder that the user sort of had some weird access to at some point. And so, um, and you just target that in any random device driver, any random um, you know, an operating system file, and now you've got control of the system. So I'm going to answer a slightly different question, like, what's your favorite security bug? Um, and this is a little esoteric, but it's just such a great bug, I wish it were my fault. Um, the, uh, there was a... Before we had SSH, there was a uh, program called Secure Telnet. It's basically Telnet, and it would do a Diffie-Hellman key exchange with a Telnet server uh, and uh, use a DES key to encrypt the traffic data encryption standard key. DES keys were 56 bits um, long, and that is actually going to be of some relevance. Um, so a Diffie-Hellman key exchange is basically you do some stuff and you get Two sides know a random number that anyone monitoring won't be able to figure out, and you use that as a secret, and you use that as a um, as your key material for your session, and then you use a DES, you use that to create a DES key, and so on. The secure telnet program kind of worked, and, and some people were using it. Eventually, it got replaced by um, SSH, um, but somebody noticed that somewhere about in a version about five years before they noticed it, um, it was always using a key of all zeros. Um, and, um, you know, the question is, why is it doing that? And in fact, if you revert back to, you know, early versions, it worked just fine. Now, the thing about it having it be a key of all zeros, it'll still work just fine. You'll successfully communicate, and it'll in fact be encrypted. It's just always going to be encrypted with the same key. Why was this doing it? Well, it turns out there was a bug fix in the DES library. DES keys are 56 bits long, but in fact the DES key package is 64 bits long. The other eight bits are a parity bit, uh, are parity bits. So, um, you know, odd or even for each byte of the um, seven bytes of the DES key. Uh, if you just take a random um, Diffie-Hellman output, one out of every 256 times, the parity bits will happen to be right. 
the other 255 times they're going to be wrong and it'll be invalid. The old DS library had a bug in it that it didn't check the parity bits and it would just let you load any key even if the parity bits were invalid. The new um, uh, uh, version of the DS library fixed this bug and would reject key loads if they had an incorrect parity bit. But the code didn't actually check to see if it had been rejected. And so, 255 out of 256 times you would use secure telnet, it would never set the key, and it would just stay at all zeros. Um, even though when the code was originally written, it worked fine, and it was a bug fix that caused it to be an undetected security flaw, passively um, uh, exploitable for five years. Amazingly, the all zeros has another implication in our history and security. That was the code to launch the Minutemans. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All zeros. Because they didn't want anybody to forget it, so it's all it's all, it's all zeros. Can you do secure injection on prepared statements? Oh, interesting. Depends on how those are constructed. If they're constructed by concatenating strings, bad. If they're constructed by having placeholders, no problem. Yeah, I'm thinking prepared statements are okay. Yeah, it's, it's just, it depends, of course, as, as, as I think what Randall's kind of getting at, but I just want to make it more clear, is, is that the underlying SQL driver that you're using, particularly if you're using, like, JDBC had a lot of pluggable backend drivers, and so you'd oftentimes have somebody who didn't really know what they were doing writing the actual underlying driver, and they might do string concatenation in order to implement the, the plus, sorry, in order to implement, like, the question marks, which is really, really horrible. Uh, and then there was a class of, like, no, no SQL injection attacks, um, where it looked like you had something where you had a good placeholder and it was entirely structured in a JSON object, but it turns out that certain JSON keys that began with a dollar sign were actually the query language, and so people could actually pass in, yeah, it was just, you have to be a little bit careful with that sort of thing, but, but if the people who are writing the underlying libraries are sane, then no. Cool. Good question. Oh, good. Um, <laughs> I'll, just do this. I'll just do this right here. I'll be right James Brown. <laughs> okay, so I go to Jackson State University in Alabama, and they are one of the few colleges who still teach COBOL, because COBOL is considered to be a dying language. My teacher told me about this patch that they did for Y2K, where everything bef or after the year 38 is just fine, and uh, it's considered, and you have to put then. Everything after the year 38 has a 19 in front of it. Everything before is has the 20s. So we're going to have another Y2K, but why oh, 2038? We're going to have a much bigger 2038 problem because of Unix. Oh, yeah. God. The time. Yeah. yeah. What, what's Sorry, what's your guys' opinion on that? Yeah. Just for people who don't know, it's a 32-bit number, number of seconds since the epoch of 1970 is 2038. Right. <laughs> oh. I just wanted to know everyone's opinion on that. Scary. It's lazy I guess, I guess coding. My, my direct opinion on that fix is that I understand why they did it. Because they were like, you know what, all the rest of our computers are going to stop working in 2038, so we're going to have to address this problem then anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so we may as well make this stop working at the same time. <laughs> my grandmother would. I'll probably be dead by then anyway. There's <laughs> stockpile guns and food. Yeah. And you get an old car that doesn't have any computer chips or anything into it, or gas. And we're all going to race endlessly over a devastated landscape, road warrior style. And it's going to be fucking sweet. <laughs> Wait, is this when we switch to Windows? Is Windows ever all over them? No Windows. Uh, of course, it was fun. To, I mean, it's it's fun to think that. And I, I of course, said a lot of the same things in 1998. But then the year 2000 happened, and despite the the video feed of the uh, ball dropping in the New York, in, in New York, switching to Washington D.C., where it was all black for some reason, two seconds before the thing, and I'm like, it's happening. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing happened. <laughs> we did a lot of work to prevent that. Did your job right. <laughs> I was sitting in a data center with a backup generator generator ready to switch over and yeah we actually had a rifle with some ammo there just because one of the managers thought shit might go down it's like yeah okay yeah i'll sit here you can pay me triple time and then i'm gonna go join my partying friends at midnight 30 so i'm for me and i was on a plane over the atlantic ocean <laughs> <laughs> and i got lasik surgery in mid 99 because i said if this is going to go down bad at least i want to be able to watch it <laughs> i i only asked because i've read i obviously didn't really get to experience it i was weak but uh 
I've read a lot of articles for people who were working crazy hard during the actual incident itself. And I'm all, oh, you have words? I gotta ask, has anyone else in IT gotten this? Because I've heard this on two separate occasions post Y2K where um, clueless manage management people um, after the dot-com bubble burst were laughing going, See, I, this is our revenge on you IT nerds for lying to us about that Y2K bullshit so you can make all that money because nothing happened. I mean, we, you think you were pulling a fast one over us and you got greedy and haha, the tech bubble collapsed and now we're in charge again and we're going to fuck you over. Honestly believe Y2K was an IT conspiracy. <laughs> I have to counterpoint that with, because well, you're probably supporting my point about now, which is if you read the risks digest throughout the previous couple of years before Y2K, you saw there was a lot of stuff going on to fix it. That's the reason nothing happened. We fixed it. You're we worked on it. And we did work on it. Here's the point. Some of the stuff that was fixed for Y2K actually broke in 2001. <laughs> because we had, a patch, we had a patch that worked for just one year, and in 2001, though, things broke. It was pretty crazy. I'm hoping to get some insight. Uh, I mentioned before that I'm a mechanic, and if you actually look at the network map they make for modern cars, they're putting absolutely everything on a parallel network. So if any one goes down, including the door switch, the door lock actuator, the trunk light, the lights themselves are on the network now. Your PCM, the one that runs the engine, will go down. Why would you put everything on one network as opposed to running two networks? Idiots. <laughs> no, here's the big thing, though. These are the attack vectors that they're now taking over smart cars with, where they're actually able to break in through your entertainment system and then say, put on the brakes. That is crazy. That should not be on the same network. Even the, there's some airplanes designed that way too, so we're actually seeing some like issues there. But they're trying to get those more into separate networks and stuff. But no, we, idiots. The DEF CON car hacking videos are terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> Truly terrifying. And awesome. Those and, awesome. And, awesome. <laughs> and awesome. And awesome. I agree, but. Right. If you go back and listen to the uh, hacking panel we had on uh, hacking self-driving cars, it's like well, yesterday, two days ago, somewhere there, right? I, I was doing space guys. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. All right. well, okay. You probably covered it in that. Then I just want to note that there's absolutely no security to any of the settings inside the thing. I can access it with no credentials whatsoever, with yeah. just my laptop. We we have Thank a lot of clueless you. people <laughs> creating <laughs> secure or creating what should be secure software. Yes. Was that on the canvas? Anyone else want to jump in? Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I used to do, um, uh, there was a company that I worked for for a while, I was a consultant for for a while, it was uh, Vitronix. They build uh, a lot of car diagnostics tools. And one thing I will say is that certainly not all cars have the problem, it's all on the same bus. Um, there, there often are separate buses for the more critical things. Um, if nothing else, it's just to get swamped by the simpler things. Um, but there's also this question that comes up. So as mentioned, like the lack of security for the settings you can do with a laptop. I'm highly concerned if Johnny, and Johnny X over here can do it from like his house and he can attack my car, as was the case when Charlie Miller was doing that with, uh, I think it was the, the Toyota vehicles. Yeah. Maybe I got it wrong. Prius vehicles. Uh, yeah, but there was, it was a lot of Ford vehicles. It was either Ford or Toyota. Um, and so the. Um, uh, okay. Well, Charlie Miller, when he was doing the remotely, I'm not as concerned, but, but, I, but I should be somewhat concerned if somebody can do it from inside my car. And so the thing is that's weird about that, right, is that I hear people talk a lot about the security that needs to happen inside, like if you manage to get to the ODB2 port inside my car and have all the security credentials on there, you can just cut my damn brake lines. You can, there's so many things you can do to my car if you were actually like at my car, in my car, you can put water in my gas tank, you can, uh, you, you, can you can just break part of my transmission, like there's so many things that you can do that I'm not actually that concerned about your ability to plug a port into my car and modify some of the software settings if you're already at my car, particularly if you're already in, sitting inside of my car with access to the diagnostics port. But yeah, network accessible cars are really <coughs> freaking out. Yeah, although car to car communication is, you know, kind of the next generation. Yeah, and that is freaking me out. Like there was, so there was the, the car panel, which was, yeah, I went, I went to part of that, um, and they were talking about the car to car communication, and I'm just sitting there, and it's just like, no. 
Because because there's there's no way you can verify that the GPS coordinates that are being sent are accurate. You can there's no there's no cryptographic primitive you're going to be able to utilize in order to verify that that location is correct. Um, it, there's no way you're going to be able to verify any of the information sent from any of the cars. And so you could just buy some cars and then just make, pretend whatever you're trying to do with them. Yeah, I mean, oh, if a vehicle ahead of you says you're uh, he stopped all of a sudden down to 20 miles an hour. Is that going to immediately stop you? Yeah, it's like it's like if, if we're if we're going to do this, we really need to be just thinking about the what the, the local primitives that the individual cars are having, and then oh, if there's if there's any kind of network information, um, it, you, you can use that. I, mean, I can even say like even using it as a hint, I'm concerned with just any because because of the, yeah, I, I've seen people use hints in order to like try to like affect the probability of behavior in certain ways, but I'm just I, I find network accessible anything really scary, and network accessible cars. <laughs> oh, but be it's afraid. so convenient. Ask your next question, so, but be afraid. So I, I, I wanted to say one thing. Uh, the point you just made about actual access to the ODB2 port slash brake line slash transmission slash whatever else. Uh, physical security is always key. Um, I wanted to change gears with you guys. Uh, what do you think of voice biometrics? I work for another couple days. I have no, the convolutional neural networks now are so good that actually there was a demo two months ago of of like taking Donald Trump and uh, Barack Obama and constructing very very convincing speech from them, um, and particularly you can use okay. that as an adversarial model against the systems that are that 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 are that are trying to read your biometrics and it. When you do these adversarial models, it can actually be really weird because it might generate static, and the other system might go, "Oh, that's Barack Obama," um, <laughs> uh, because of just the exact thing that it's. There testing. was a thing on BBC so. about that a, a couple months ago, where they tested two different companies' engines, and one of them, uh, one of they they took twins. One of the presenters happened to be twins on the show, and they took twins, like identical twins. They put them through voice um, acting classes to teach them how to sound like each other, and then tested. And one engine to call it, one engine to not. And I just, I thought that was super interesting, and mm -hmm. I wanted to know if you guys had any insights. I mean, the fundamental problem of biometric, biometric authentication for anything is, you know, you can't change your password, right? Uh, you know, if your body is the uh, the thing generating it, uh, and it gets compromised, and someone finds a way to emulate that. You know, you're stuck with it. You know, uh, you know, if, if it's a fingerprint, okay, maybe you have nine backup fingers uh, at some point that you can uh, uh, that, that, that you that you can use. But uh, you know, you only have one voice, right? You only have two eyes. So uh, you know, this is a pretty short-sighted um, model, particularly because it guarantees sort of authenticator reuse among other things. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's just misguided. And I would add to implementation, if, if any of you, I'm sorry, if, if you were in my earlier talk, Hacking Mobile Applications, this was an example where this uh, app mobile application had voice recognition. That was your login. Hi, my name is Ray. You would record that, and it would let you log in. Okay, that's cool, and it worked. It was great. Anyone else would talk into it, try to sound like it, it wouldn't let you in. Well, when we started testing the app, we started looking at the uh, data directory of that application, the mobile app. And the tester had found there was a random file there, and it was something like zebra.xyz. It made no sense. And we, we, he had opened that file up, and we're looking at it, and it would look like it was garbage. So it was binary, encrypted, it was something. And when we took a closer look up near the top, we started seeing things like genre, year made, album title. And so it's a RIF format file with the voice. Program. It was straight up MP3. So what we did is we drug the file off onto the guy's computer, renamed it MP3, hit play, and held the phone up. Hi, my name is Ray, and it unlocked it. So, <laughs> yes. so yes. implementation yes. of biometrics too is pretty. That's not the right way to go about yeah, it. It's like if you're doing facial recognition with one camera and you have a picture of the person, you just show a picture of the person, yeah. and it's going to let you in. Um, and then also with these, um, uh, with, with voice, uh, to bring up uh, with what Matt was saying, something else is, is that at least your, your, your fingerprints, you might have to be close to the person in order to try to get it. Um, in the case of a, um, um, in the case of like an iris scan, like how often do you have a high resolution photo of somebody's, somebody's eye, you can just call somebody up on the phone and, and, and just pretend to be you know, somebody random talking to them for a couple minutes and now you have their voice. Like it, it, voice is just such an easy one to pull from just about anybody. The applications I like the, the most about kind of spin-off applications are being able to build um, libraries if you've got enough source material. I've got a lot of recordings of William S. Burroughs and Hunter S. Thompson, and I've been feeding that in some of the spin-off applications so I can have guys who've been dead for years and decades do uh, new station IDs for my radio show. 
Yeah, I'm William S. Burroughs, and I'm dead. You're listening. That type of stuff. So. <laughs> uh, I just want to say, I just want to say one thing. I actually do work for a company that deals with voice biometrics, not in the research department, but on the actual implementation side. Uh, it's not entirely true that you only have one voice. Uh, it very much does depend on how old you are and how you're feeling, because if you call in and like we and like your institution or whatever that was our product does all this stuff while you're sick, it's not going to sound the same. Like if you call in and you get healthy, it's not going to recognize. Yeah. And additionally, if you call in, uh, all this all the setup happens when you're 25. It might not necessarily register when you're 45. So it's not entirely correct to say there is like you have just one voice in this situation. Like you only have 10 sets of fingerprints. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, so uh, yeah, I think I mean, the point is it's like the worst part of both sides of this, right? <laughs> it's not going to be reliable, and you can't do anything to consciously change it. Yeah, like to, back up, to back up Matt's point on that, I'm going to say that um, the way you would take advantage of that, and like the way that as a user, if you, if, if you know you have great recordings of my voice and you can simulate it, the way that I would have to take advantage of that is either waiting for my voice to change as, uh, as my voice box grows uh, or a little bit or, or, or weakens over the course of another five to ten years, or I would have to purposely get sick every time I want to log into my computer. <laughs> uh, so, it's, like it's, just, it's just an inability to do quick key revocation is essentially what the, yeah. the, what the point was about. But. So uh, back in my uh, tech support days, I had some very interesting phone calls uh, with some very angry customers. Uh, for example, one of which uh, uh, my job involved dealing with firewalls at fast food restaurants and parking garages. Um, we got a call one day where I was dealing with a customer um, and uh, they needed to make a firewall change, but we of course had to get approval from the franchise. And the guy basically told me, you don't make this firewall change right now, I'm gonna come there and slit your throat and crazy stuff like that. But have you guys ever had just like any just crazy experiences back in tech support? I imagine we've all worked at that, you know, in that type of job at some point or another. My throat's different than slit. It's all going bloody. <laughs> Similar is when you deliver reports of like vulnerabilities to clients. When you deliver reports to vulnerabilities of vulnerabilities to clients and stuff like that, a lot of times They'll be very antagonistic about it, even though you're trying to help them. So I've definitely had people that say, like, no, that's not a real finding. Like, that, that's, not, that's not correct. <laughs> it's Denial. Like, it's like, I have the steps to reviews there. There's screenshots. There's everything that you need to, to see that it's actually wrong. They say, no, that's, that's not true. I don't, I don't agree. There's nothing to agree on. <laughs> but it happens all the time. So. We include screenshots with every report that we do on an assessment because we get that all the time. No, that's that's not a bone. That's not a bone. Look right here. Your username and password was logged out. You know, using logd or whatever. You know, to the out you know, to the console. It's a vulnerability, and we do that for that because we do get pushback. The not exactly a tech support nightmare, just a kind of funny uh, tech fail when I was working for the. Um, porn site web hosting place. We had, um, you know, we monitored the servers to check that the load shot up to ridiculous levels for some reason. Everything was pretty uh, uh, homogenized and you could get in and run scripts across the entire uh, um, uh, data center. Uh, we had some audio alerts, blah, blah, blah. And um, I was working day shift with one other sysadmin one day and this one particular server, we started getting these audio alerts every couple minutes that, um, uh, I don't remember exactly, basically we, we filled around and realized that VAR was filled up, slash VAR, and we looked in and there were all these uh, files in there and they were APIs for anime shows, and we're like, <laughs> what the hell, uh, you know, call the customer up real quick, hey, uh, you, you know, were you short on storage or something, you know, you've got all this. <laughs> these anime videos sitting here in slash R, it's causing problems with your uh, server and probably interfering with a lot of customers' orgasms. Can we delete this stuff? <laughs> and they're like, yeah, I don't know what the fuck that is. Yeah, go ahead and nuke it all. And so, yeah, delete. We, we delete it and yeah, everything's fine, server's running fine. And um, um, a couple Good. seconds later, we Man. Get, or a couple minutes later, we get the warning again, and we check, and there's some anime stuff in there, and VAR is filling up, and there's also a text file that said, um, whoever deleted the animes is gonna be in trouble. 
dot text. <laughs> Call the customer back up and say, have you installed any new scripts or anything recently on your machine? He said, well, yeah, we've got this PHP script we installed uh, a couple hours ago. And it's like, okay, you should probably disable that for uh, for now because apparently there's a vulnerability that's being exploded, uh, exploited. And they're like, oh my god, oh my god. So went back in and we cleaned out slash var again. We made sure the script was disabled. Uh, before we made sure the script was disabled, we left a text file in there that said, shouldn't have filled up var where we never would have noticed <laughs> fuck <him."> and, <laughs> and, <laughs> and then we deleted it and we nuked the script and yeah. So. Okay. Uh, what I'm bringing up here is not necessarily a question for you guys, but something for everybody in the panel to play around with. I have gone to Best Buy. I've gone to Fry's, I've gone to Micro Center. Very often they will have a remote control uh, sitting by their TVs on display. Most of the TVs nowadays are smart TVs. So you can connect your phone to that and walk away. And if you wanted to, you could play porn on TVs or whatever just to fuck with people. Are you the guy who's been putting Goatsy on all the TVs? <laughs> I have done that. <laughs> This is why Home Depot had to turn off the Wi-Fi on their fridges because that exact thing happened. Yeah. This is why we can't have nice things. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, teach these stores not to leave the remotes out, exploit the fuck out of it, and uh, teach them a lesson. Alleged. Alleged. Yeah. Alleged. 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 Oh, do you? Oh, yeah, 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 smart TVs. Uh, we should do a smart TV panel and scare the hell out of people who don't know much about them and show how easily they can be turned into spy devices. Oh, oh, so, um, going back to biometrics, um, what do you guys think about keyboard dynamics as one? Because to me, that just doesn't seem like a viable option to like authenticating yourself. I, I hear that it works. Um, I, I hear that um, it's it's some of the things that you can figure out from. I mean, there's keyboard dynamics of, uh, for biometrics, and then there's a very very related thing, which is like if you can just like hear the or see, feel the vibrations of somebody using the keyboard, like on a mobile phone or something, you can just feel what they're typing. All that. But but it just comes back to Matt's point about how it, 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 the the way in which I type is something that I've kind of built up over the course of many years, and uh, if, if somebody else um, is, records me typing, possibly by just being inside of an application on my phone, if it's that kind of typing, or sitting on my computer and it's just reading from my keyboard um, temporarily, um, then they can build up those same patterns and essentially build up that same model and then generate me. So. Right, cool, thank you. I'm just curious whether or not you guys have ever uh, encountered something that occurred to me a long time ago, and that was uh, people are always worried about viruses getting into the RAM and everything like that. Well, we've also got the RAM that's in the video cards. Has anybody ever actually done anything to try and infect those instead and put some kind of a virus in there that would, would take over the machine? I mean, obviously, you've got to, you'd have to tailor it to every video card that was on the market, which would be tricky, but it seems like you should be able to do something along those lines. You've got code that in there that, that gets run. Yeah, so I think Randall's going to check up on, yeah. uh, on on whether these things exist. But when you say like RAM, though, I'm well, when I'm saying you know the yeah. memory that's in a video card, yeah. when you program, reprogram it, put in new, new yeah. You know, I, I've never I, heard I, of anything. Are, are video cards typically firmware upgradable? Yeah, yeah. 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 I recall okay. reading some like proof of concept paperwork. Uh, you know, papers on it, but that doesn't mean that there's anything that's actually been implemented in the wild. I'm just there's a lot of scary enough. proof of concept yeah. stuff that you know people put out there, and the stuff gets closed. It just, just seems it. doable. Right. They you run know, you talk about the e-cigarette kind of thing. Hang on, they what run does Bitcoin Google have for you? Stuff. <laughs> 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 we'll have an answer for you in a few minutes. Next question, we'll do it. Next question, we'll do it. Next question, we'll do it. Yeah, I'm just curious if y'all have any stories of tech bloopers or blunders that just kind of were incredibly random. Uh, this was actually during that interview I mentioned earlier. There was about 15 support engineers and they were like, okay, assess the Bluetooth. So I had my iPad. I like to name my uh, personal hotspot random things for shits and giggles. And uh, in a room of about 15 people, it says, now connected to Daddy Loves Cocaine and Big Black Cock. <laughs> and, and I just stood there frozen and I was wondering if uh, y'all had any funny stories like that. 
I, I, I got boatloads of them. Right. Because, uh, Let's get a couple I am stories. not kidding you because uh, in like 2001, 2002, when we were writing WebInspect, it was kind of the new, the new thing, right? So automated penetration testing. You point an app at a website and it just has that and SQL injection, cross-data scripting. And, but at the same time, we're just injecting tons of shit into people's back ends. So... Sounds like a day in the porno place. <laughs> we, we had an example where uh, we had a large airline as a customer. They were trying us out. And uh, so we got their information for their website. They were supposed to give us their staging website, but they gave us their production no! website. Oh! We booked an entire air uh, flight with people named Jack Frost. <laughs> <laughs> and, on our, and they didn't realize for months that it had happened. It was, we actually had the entire plane booked because we spent to go to a forum, right? And you're submitting this data to buy a ticket. Right. And sure enough, just blah, 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 and just took up the whole flight. I mean, we got, we've done crazy stuff like that. <laughs> but it was kind of their fault, which was good, that they gave us the wrong <laughs> server uh, to point at. So, yeah, uh, when we did the voting system review um, uh, for uh, a, a certain Midwestern state uh, about uh, 10 years ago, they sent us uh, a bunch of voting machines to um, hack with and, you know, assured us that these machines would never be used in a real election. Um, and so, you know, we felt free to be as uh, destructive and creatively malicious as we could. Um, with them. One of the machines they sent was the, you know, they sent a sample of the optical scanners used uh, for, um, in uh, precinct counted optical scanners where you fill out the bubble sheet and um, submit it at your uh, voting polling place. The DRE machines, the touch screen machines. And also the machine, the big machine that counts the absentee ballots. And so um, we loaded, is the camera running? <laughs> yeah. Um, so Allegedly. we loaded some soft. Well, on the the machine that uh, runs the uh, um, absentee ballot counting is a big bulk scanner. It weighs you know like a thousand pounds. It had to be delivered by truck, and you know it was hard to get in the room. It was a little surprising to us that they said they were never going to use this again after they. Uh, loaned it to us, but, you know, we said, are you sure? And, you know, yeah, yeah, it'll, it'll never be used again. So we um, uh, modified the machine so that you had to um, solve a puzzle in order to count the ballots. Then come November, uh, during the actual election, get this call um, uh, 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 saying, you know, we think you, you, you know something about these machines because you wrote the report on them. Um, can you, um, you know, maybe you can help us out. It's in this mode, it's not in the manual. Um, you know, there's this puzzle that we have to solve. And we're going to uh, 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 boot the thing up. And so, oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Are you in uh, that state that uh, we did this for? Well, one of the counties. Oh, yeah. You can't use that. <laughs> um, you know, the other problem is that the, the uh, end result was. Uh, uh, would uh, always uh, have me win the election for overboard. Um, so, uh, if they actually used to count ballots, uh, you, know, I, I'd have, you know, I'd have been governor or overboard at the state. So one of the questions earlier was about having a GPU virus. And with a quick Google, I got headline, got a Bitcoin mining virus on my PC. Right. GPU is under full load when idle. Now that doesn't mean it's a GPU virus per se, it might be just a Windows virus that's driving the GPU. But yes, so that has already been seen in the wild. Well, but I'm, I'm talking about actually putting code into the, into the GPU itself, because I, I, I don't any, any virus system isn't going to detect that. I don't it know. It gets into there, I mean, yeah, I, 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 Well, apparently this guy in, in this yeah. thread took a lot of work to try to get it finally off his system. It wasn't just straight virus detection like that because probably it didn't have the kind of payload that would normally be for a Windows virus. Yeah. So yeah, that's probably part of it. I don't know that your GPU has any state between reboots, so I don't know that you could actually put anything there. It has that BIOS Well, yeah, I mean, but you can do a BIOS I can put the firmware, I can push the firmware to it, you know. Oh, okay. Somebody well, needs yeah. to put a payload into the firmware, this is what I don't know about machines. Like firmware. Cool. Well, I think they could do that. Again, I don't know that they... Anyway, at least Bitcoin has happened.
So you guys might appreciate this because uh, I'd just like to add one thing to the blooper reel. Um, a close colleague of mine actually works for the school system, and that's just going to go downhill from there. Um, so um, they decided to deploy Chromebooks for the entire county uh, for a couple of different high schools, and uh, someone in the IT department forgot to flash like actual OS that was secured onto any of them. So there was about 2,000 Chromebooks that were just open that you could do anything with. And uh, they had to recall all of those over the course of like three months and they didn't get like 500 of them back. Um, but I did actually have a construction question for you. Has there actually been a point uh, where you guys, uh, I, I guess I was trying to, I was gonna ask for a success story that you uh, was particularly memorable? That was uh, something that was kind of difficult to catch, but you were able to turn things around for whoever it is you were working for? <laughs> <laughs> you stumped us, you win the interview. Are you sure you want to go into this career? <laughs> We can remember our failures like that, but we're drawing a blank on our successes. I, I, maybe we're just in the wrong. <laughs> That's all proprietary. Clearly, it's just that we succeed so often that we don't want to remember before. Us. I think we just need to all drink. It, it, it's us that this question next year. Maybe you'll remember something. Like that. It's hard because there's no winning, right? I mean, yeah, we we find vulnerabilities all the time. We tell the customers, "Look, you got straight up SQL injection right here. Great. You know, we feel good, but." The next test comes through the next month, and there's something even more egregious, right? So it, it's kind of weird. Where it's just it's just a rolling thing. That, so it's, it's kind of hard to measure, I think. Or they didn't fix it. Didn't well, uh, thanks for the Dragon Con achievement of stopping the panel. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I wish we had beer to throw at you. <laughs> I don't know how much of the article I read was just pie in the sky, fluff, whatever, but there was a tech article I briefly skimmed a few months ago about uh, hacking air-gapped systems that have no forms of external communications. Uh, they were talking about things like using fan speed to send signals to an audio microphone that's near it, oh, thermal, um, thermal transmission heating up the GPU in order to send uh, binary patches at like, was it, 8 bits a minute or something like that? Yeah. But uh, I don't know how realistic any of that could be is you'd have to have at least a receiver really close to it that would also be able to get the data out. As I mentioned, there's a lot of really scary as shit proof of concept papers <laughs> out there, but fortunately a lot of them don't actually make it out into the wild. But yeah, I read some stuff about making hard drive LEDs blink, making lights on um, dis you know, display lights on routers blink if you've got if you've owned an Internet of Things camera system, you can do stuff like that, just gradual infiltration. But again, I know of no actual incidents that have happened, or at least some have been publicly reported. So you could think of Larry. So, yeah, no, I, I, it's definitely a thing. Um, for like a few hundred bucks on a weekend, you could actually do it yourself uh, with keyboards. Uh, even if you have a, a hardwired keyboard to your, your desktop or whatever, and you're air-gapped from that, you can use an SDR and you can actually read like passive radiation, passive radio signals that your keyboard is giving off when you hit buttons. Yeah. And you can map those to specific keys on the keyboard. Each key has its and own So you sound. can actually just keylog someone over an air gap network. And there's lots of proof of, con proof of concepts out there of people actually succeeding in doing that. And I think uh, someone named A Bad Idea gave a DEF CON talk about it, how she was able to do that just over a week in the office. So are you saying when I go home, I'm going to have to buy a whole bunch of chicken wire and screen and build a Faraday cage around my yes. house? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. The U.S. Actually, government has like a set of... the Tempest. Yeah, the Tempest program is, is specifically designed to prevent that from happening. It's a thing again? Yeah. yeah it's, it's actually, we had that so in the 80s. Government so so programs had a, never go away. I had a, I had a student, um, a patient of mine, Gaurav Shah, read his thesis. Uh, it's on uh, covert channels in different places. And, you know, he's got keyboard covert channels that can be read over the internet, uh, you know, going, you know, across, uh, you know, 20 hops of routers, timing channels, and in different devices. And the thing is, these things don't get exploited in the wild very often, and we don't take them seriously, right up until they are exploited in the wild, and then suddenly they become 
kind of crisis level um, things. So yeah, and, and, you know, in some sense, we take a little comfort in the fact that um, you know some of these proof of concepts haven't been exploited yet. I, then I come back to reality and realize that because they haven't been exploited, no one's fixing them, so they're waiting for someone to exploit them. So, or maybe somebody has, you guys haven't thought. Yep, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so just holding them in the back. I think it's also worth just bringing up that a lot of times we, we have these proof concepts of, of like really high powered exploits that maybe one day would be would uh, would need to be used if it weren't for the fact that right now you just put on a high vis vest, walk in, say that you're here to repair the air ducts in that room, go to the room, plug a USB key into the air gap computer. I mean, it's just there's just so many fails in the entire security process of all these things. That... So this question, I guess, is a culmination of everything you've been saying right now. I mean, you, this is dumb. <laughs> who, who picked up the whole thing? Those yeah, do that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you like know how to break things. You understand how things work. You were here like as this stuff was starting. I would assume there's some degree of paranoia that comes into your field. What? And there's all these different ways to interface with computers, biometrics. Like I read this thing at work. There's like a DNA hack. Someone encoded like malicious code onto DNA and put it into a system and did some horrible stuff. What point do you get so paranoid that you just stop? getting certain things like do you, is there like a phone that point that's like too advanced that you don't like mesh that anymore like what at what point do you stop interfacing with technology and become like primitive to be able to protect your stuff well maybe as soon as i go home i mean this is really <laughs> fucking depressing <laughs> be a painter or something you know uh, yeah yeah, I mean, I, I, you learn all this scary stuff, and you realize, like, I, I came to terms with the fact that I have no idea how to secure my phone, right, uh, at this point. I'm good at this stuff, but, you know, if somebody, a determined adversary is going to be able to find a way to own me in, in ways that would be catastrophic. And, you know, my choice is to go and, you know, go to a remote island and go completely off the grid and, uh, um, you know, live my life, um, uh, you know, in, in a way that I'm probably not well equipped to do without dying really quickly. Right? So, you know, I, I am unfortunately poorly adapted to, you know, a world without modern society and unfortunately this is, all we can do is, you know, keep trying to outrun the bear. I'd say there certainly are some things that you can do that are that are like pushing your risks more than other things, and you can kind of like minimize those risk factors. I mean, like I, I'm not particularly interested in having a, a um, uh, one of those assistants that I can speak to constantly listening in my apartment. I that I, that one I avoid. Um, I don't upload all of my photos automatically to iCloud or Google Photos. I don't want to have all the stuff that I like that. I just I um, uh, but I do because I've been. I, even in particularly, so I've, I've gotten into politics recently, it's, it's, it's actually really difficult to, to communicate effectively with people if you don't have Facebook, you're not running Facebook pages and everything, everyone else is using Facebook. You can't, you, you can't have to run events and be able to put things on there, and so I do use Facebook a lot, even though I go and I give talks at hackathons about the horrors and evils of centralized <laughs> systems such as Facebook. Um, it's, uh, but yeah, there's, there's some things, there's some things that it's like, it would be really difficult for me to not have a phone it is currently, at least, very easy for me to not have a network attached refrigerator. Um, so I avoid a network attached refrigerator. Yeah, and that won't be true. That might not be true at some point. And I'd say, yeah, I, it'll be, that'll be really good. Yeah. I don't click on links on emails. That's my rule. I, no, I don't care if it's from family, I don't care who it's from, I'm not clicking on a link. All you gotta do is hover. <laughs> so then, uh, at what point are the threats worth it? I mean, it's kind of just about realizing the context in which your actions are being performed. Like, if you're trying to hack a bank or something, don't do it from your home Wi-Fi. But at, at yeah. some point, it's like, if I'm, sending, if I'm sending Alleged. photos, yeah, if I'm sending photos to like a family member, like, do it on Facebook. Like, what's, what do you have to lose? Thank you. All right, a quick announcement before we get to the next question. Pizza's about 10 minutes away, so as soon as we get the, it's here, it's here, we'll abandon the Marriott and rush in a mad frenzy across the sky bridge to grab the pizza before anyone else can get it. So, um, also, I, I forgot I was supposed to mention this earlier. Um, how many of you are um, 
either in school studying something aerospace related or have aerospace experience and would be interested in attending a, um, it's not an official NASA convention, but it's run by a bunch of NASA rocket scientists and they're looking to expand their base of presenters at the next convention. And the topic is uh, laying the engineering, um, uh, putting the engineering in place for launching our first interstellar probe within the next 10 years and we've got funding. So I have cards and information about this year's convention and come see me when we leave the room and I'll be more than happy to talk to you about that and let you know who you need to speak to at NASA if you're interested in getting involved in presenting at the next convention and seeing what we've already got in place. Okay, sorry about that. Next question. Not really a question. Uh, three things. One, security's process is not a goal. And until you get people to understand that, they're going to be dead in the water, it doesn't matter. They're, they're just going to give themselves up over time. Uh, two, China's having more fun right now GPSing you with your little robot vacuum. And it's calling home and telling them to be a complete layout of your home. Yeah. <clears throat> fun times. Uh, three, don't stop learning. No. Every day. Never stop learning. Never. Because it's getting really, really easy to do this to people. I just want to say uh, something about some of the problems I'm running into. I work for a major security software firm, and I'm on site as a resident consultant. Can you get closer to the mic? Sure. I work, I work for a resident, uh, a resident consultant for a major software firm, security software firm. And uh, they did a pen test for the environment, which they didn't tell me about. So all of a sudden, I have everything going off. And then about like a week later, I'm like, what's going on, guys? I'm getting hit by, all, by these two networks, uh, these two IP addresses. And I'm like, oh, yeah, go ahead and put that in the IPS as safe and secure because we're not getting the results we want coming out of the pen test. So the next thing I know is every time I turn around, they're like, oh, yeah, this is free and safe. Go ahead and put it in. And then they get that pen test they wanted to buy what they wanted to buy the software. Uh, how do you fight that kind of stuff when you're, uh, you know, especially since they're going against the software I'm trying to, you know, I was purchased to, uh, you know, provide. I mean, I guess part of it, it is kind of a valuable exercise in my experience to, to turn those things off while doing a pen test because you want to see if someone does discover like an IDS bypass of some kind, which happens all the time, uh, how far are they get? Like, how much are you relying on those systems? So it'd be normal for them to come in and say, hey, look, you know, you caught it on the first layer, go ahead and turn off this. You caught it on the second layer, go ahead and turn it off so we can keep yeah, on going down deep. It, it's definitely valuable to find out where exactly in your system are you, are you going to stop finding things, if anywhere. In the interest of the Internet of Things, and I'm sorry, I keep going back to, <laughs> has there been any major advantages in... Um, hacking said devices in order to turn off the functionality without disabling them. Like, in a vehicle you can't turn off OnStall without the CPU going absolutely crazy. But I would love to find a way that I could brick the antenna to make it think it's still there and still talking when it's not. Don't buy that fridge, man. Don't buy that fridge. <laughs> I don't have that fridge. <laughs> I gave the salesman a good uh, earful about why I'm not getting that uh, stove either. Yeah, I'm seeing more and more questions on various tech forums about where to find um, non-smart insert whatever device you're looking for. So, I don't know, comments? Yeah, so I mean, I think one of the problems is architectural. You know, a, a lot of these systems are designed essentially based on where it's smart and it's on the internet, but there's another part of that which is even more disturbing, which is it's dependent on a server that's run by the manufacturer. And you know that's a kind of very typical architecture for IoT devices that need remote access in order to you know uh, you, you configure it through a server not running on the device but running at the vendor. Now one problem is you know the vendor goes out of business and now your device suddenly can't be reconfigured and might just stop working. Um, the other problem is that if you don't connect it, it won't work at all. Right? And, and so it must have an internet connection in order to work, period. And that architecture is particularly hostile to the disabling the uh, um, smart functionality. 
example from earlier in, um, in the evening, the Samsung Smart TVs, uh, roughly two grand that ship without working firmware, just a bootloader that has to be connected. You have to connect it to the internet to download the firmware to make your TV work because they didn't have the firmware finished when they shipped the hardware. And oops, they made a mistake and it just bricked your $2,000 TV. Fresh out of the box. Um, in response to an earlier question about how much tech do you adopt considering the security vulnerabilities, um, being new to the security field and uh, talking with lots of people more experienced than me, explaining it in layman's terms, um, it's good for everyone to remember that security is about risk management. How much risk you're willing to accept, because you will accept some there's always always going to be some level of risk you're going to have to accept as long as you're working in tech. Um, the, uh, the other big piece of advice I got was for anybody working in security, it's we are auditors, we are not the police. Unless we are. Um, <laughs> there, there are some, but uh, our role in security is to make sure everyone is aware of what risk there is so that those in charge can make decisions about whether or not they're willing to accept that risk rather than saying, you have this risk and because you have this risk, you're not allowed to do X, Y, or Z. So um, any feedback or input on those two pearls of wisdom that I've received as to... Yes. More red. <laughs> I can add. Uh, so we get a lot of pen tests from uh, from very large, very large enterprise customers, and it's really good to see that many of them have uh, they have rules set up where uh, if they get any say medium highs or critical vulnerabilities, they are not allowed to ship the app, and that's their rule, not our rule. So we report back, hey, here's what we found, and they put processes in place to you know. Uh, sync up with us on those vulnerabilities and they do stop applications from shipping. Now those are the good guys, there's other people that don't care, but it's good whenever I see that. It warms my heart when they say, yeah, there's a high vulnerability here um, and that they do actually hold up releases. It puts pressure on us because they yell at us and they challenge us. They say, no, that's not a vulnerability, but you know, we back it up. And uh, it, it's good to see that. So the companies are coming around to that and they're taking security more seriously, I believe. And uh, hopefully that just keeps continuing. On a personal level, um, as far as risk mitigation goes for myself and family, friends who are in tech savvy, especially those who live in areas where there's a lot of activity, a lot of wireless stuff going on. Um, yeah, I know there are people out there who will always come up with, uh, smarter than me, will always come up with stuff I can't defend against, but I can make sure that my family, friends, and myself, we're not the low-hanging fruit. So. Yeah, uh, there's another good rule of thumb that don't be the low hanging fruit. Yeah, <laughs> uh, make sure there's an easier target around there for someone malicious to go after. You don't have to outswim the shark, you just have to outswim everybody else. Bingo! Thank you. <laughs> you don't need a uh, big uh, caliber gun when you are running from a bear, you just need a small caliber to shoot someone in the leg. <laughs> so, my question is more of a uh, sort of a theory and philosophical question. Uh, so DARPA was recently awarded some insane amount of money for uh, brain uh, machine interfaces uh, like full dive tech. Um, so what are your thoughts on when we become Internet of Things devices? Mm. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, back in the 80s, if you had asked me, I would have been all for the Neuromancer type implants, jack me in, woohoo! Nowadays, um, yeah, sure, if they develop the technology, they guinea pig on it, they, they guinea pig test it on a whole lot of other people first, and as long as it's not implanted or embedded in me, and I can turn it off, then yeah, I'll give it a try. <laughs> I'm not going to be a pioneer, though. Okay, I was also curious on your thoughts on biohacking in general, like gene splice, like homebrew gene splicing and all that jazz. Terrifying, but hell yeah. <laughs> Dude, I want to live forever and I want to be healthy too. So, well, one of the reasons why I do the, the things that I do the way that I do, as opposed to, for example, working behind the scenes or doing responsible disclosure or anything like that, um, is an attempt to make people aware of the security vulnerabilities that they live with 
constantly. Um, and to make developers aware of the techniques that they're using to try to build the things that they're doing are actually harming people. And I, I, I travel to very many like developer-oriented conferences, um, uh, like iPhone development conferences, or to try to give explanations of the kinds of mistakes that they're making, fundamental thought process errors that they're making in the applications that they, that they develop, in, in the hope of trying to get them to not do that. Um, and uh, I, I don't know if, if, if that's making any sense at all, but maybe if we all do that, maybe we can educate people and we can get users to care, we can get developers to care, and we can try to change what ends up happening. Because um, I, I, it does, it just feels like a dystopia to me that we're going to have to need the network accessible refrigerator, that we're going to have the network accessible brain implant, and that we're going to then end up becoming completely, you know, just owned. Ghost the show? Yeah. Yeah, they yeah. have. Don't forget the dildos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, just to bring it down to a kind of down to earth example, um, you remember our, uh, last year uh, security flaws were found in uh, a bunch of implantable medical devices like face makers, oh, oh, medical, yes. and so on. Okay, so, you know, the question now you've got the question what if you need a pacemaker? You know, you shouldn't not get a pacemaker if you need one because it has uh, security flaws uh, in it. Um, you know, so yeah, that's a, a tough, uh, uh, a tough decision. But sometimes, you know, the benefits outweigh the outweigh the risks. And apparently, right now they're recalling people with pacemakers to come in in order to get firmware upgrades to their pacemaker, but which is not necessarily safe because if there's something goes wrong during the firmware update flashing process, then the pacemaker is going to stop working. So you need to actually go on to the bypass system before you can just. Can we make a movie about this? With the pacemaker, you can network upgrades. You don't have to come in to get a firmware update. That's scary. So, <laughs> my refrigerator is going to update me. <laughs> That's the concern. Though. So the, the, the bug in these things was that you can just if you're near right. enough to the person, you can send signals to them, and yep. you can you can firmware update them. That was that was actually yeah. the problem. Yep. So. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> 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 uh, a little while ago, there was a talk about uh, keyboard vulnerability, and the one that I remember from about a year or so ago had to do with certain keyboards had certain chips in them that would communicate with a wireless keyboard, uh, even though that wasn't a feature that was advertised and, and you know, the people knew was, was available in this keyboard, somebody close by could connect to that keyboard and then with a few keystrokes could uh, format your hard drive. Pizza's arrived. Shall we migrate? Yeah. Yeah. Everyone know where we're going? No. Yeah, we'll pick up the questions. Yeah. Hi, Hilton.